Welcome to lecture 6 on our YouTube series on design of a three-storied steel structure based on Indian code. In our previous lecture, we looked at calculation and application of dead and live load on our steel roof trusses. And in today's lecture, we will see calculation of wind load and the application of that calculated wind load on our steel roof truss. So to begin with today's lecture, first, I have already opened my ETAPS model here. I would like to go to my elevation view at A and let us see this truss for some time now. You can see that here this truss is composed of these top cords or these rafters here, these bottom cords and then these vertical and inclined struts. So generally what happens is that in real life when we are building this truss, this top cord is generally a single member. Also, this another rafter is a single member and then this bottom cord is a single member. If you see our model, you can see that if you select these members here, they are individually selected here. That means they are broken at this point of intersection with other frame. So similar is the case for this bottom cord also. So what I would like to do here is I would like to join all these pieces for this one rafter and then add all these frames to make a single frame member. Similarly, I will add all these pieces on the other side and make this a single rafter as well. And also I will join all these frames of this bottom cord and I will make it a single member. And about the moment releases that we have to apply to this truss structure, we know that truss members are only designed to carry their axial load and that axial load may be either tensile or compressive. Generally, bending moments do not come onto these trusses except for the very low value of bending moment that may arise due to their own self weight. So what I would like to do is I would like to release the moments and torsion for all of these vertical and inclined strut members. And remember that our aim while modeling is always to copy the real life situation as much as possible. So if you are releasing the mem releasing the moments for these members, that means you are providing the partial fixity, then you have to design these joints in a similar fashion. So generally what we do is we make these, we weld the joints here also. But if you weld these connections, then that welding means a rigid joint here and there may be some transfer of moment. So if we are releasing the joints, if we are releasing these members, then you have to make sure that when you design the joints here, the design is performed accordingly. That means you perform a shear connection design here, not a moment connection design. So for that, what I will do is, let me select these members and then go to edit edit frames and join frames. Now this is a single member. Also for the other side, I will do the same, edit, edit frames and join frames. Also for the bottom cord here, select all these members and then go to edit, edit frames and join frames. Also go to your next elevation view that is it B and also perform the same thing here. So I will just do them and complete it by myself. So I have completed the joining of all of these frames for this top two rafters and the bottom cord. Now we will apply the partial fixity. For that, select all of these vertical and the inclined struts at elevation A, also at elevation B, at C, next elevation at D, next elevation at E, and finally at F. So we have selected all these inclined and vertical struts here. After that, go to assign frame 
and release our partial fixity what you have to do is you have to release torsion at one end and moment at both ends and then click on ok so these circular points are showing the moment releases you can see these moment releases in case of our secondary beams also is this we selected a secondary beams the connection is pinned at the joints not fixed joints but pin joints so these circular elements here represent our moment releases so save the model and go to assign and clear display of assigns now we will look at calculation of wind load we have a separate uh, youtube playlist for the detailed calculation of wind load in our steel roof truss in our steel structure in our channel in youtube we have a separate playlist for analysis and design of pre-engineered building and in that playlist if you watch some one or two videos then there are detailed explanation related to calculation of wind load based on is875 part 3 code so i will not go into that much detail in this lecture video what i will do is i have just prepared an excel sheet for the calculation and we will go through that excel sheet quickly and then apply the load that comes out after the calculation in that excel sheet itself so our calculation of wind load is based on this code here is875 part 3 which was revised in 2015 and this is the code for design loads other than earthquake for buildings and structures part 3 is for wind loads so let me go to my excel sheet directly here first there are some general information that is the span of roof truss 6.77 meter the rise of our roof truss 1.2 meter slope of our roof truss 21.21 degrees this is the spacing of purlin and then we have these three dimensions here first is the height to ifs are paraffit that means the total height of our truss from this base here to the top of our ridge here from base to ridge the total height is 11 meter the length of our building is 15.685 meter and the width of our building is 5.27 meter and these are just some spacing of trusses between different grids so now first we have to select our wind data based on our location the wind data is given in nxa in our is875 code and for now i have assumed that the basic wind speed of our location where the structure is going to be built is 50 meter per second and the terrain category is category 3 for terrain category there are three four categories 1 2 3 and 4 that you can find in clause 6.3.2.1 and category 3 means it represents the terrain with numerous closely spaced obstruction having the size of buildings or structures up to 10 meter in height with or without a few isolated tall structures so this category represents mm, it most represents the characteristics of our site so we have selected the terrain category as category 3 now let's go to calculating different design factors that are necessary for calculating the wind force first we have four factors k1 k2 k3 k4 that are needed for the calculation of design wind pressure or sorry not design wind pressure but design wind speed so the formula for design wind speed you can see here is basic wind speed vv and the product of four factors k1 k2 k3 and k4 so vv we got to be 50 meter per second and these four factors k1 is the risk coefficient factor k2 is the terrain and height factor k3 is the topography factor and k4 is the importance factor for cyclonic region you can get the values of all these factors in these different clauses in your code 6.3.1 for k1 3.2 for k2 3.3 for k3 and 3.4 for k4 i got these vectors as 1 0 0.91 1 and 1 for example let's see here k1 is the risk coefficient factor for that you have to look at table 1 here in table 1 gives us the value of k1 that is risk coefficient for different classes of structures in different wind speed zones ours is a general building structure so we have to look at this number one and the basic wind speed is 50 meter per second so our k1 factor comes out to be one now for k2 factor which is the terrain or height factor look at table 2 here 
This table 2 gives us the value of K2 factor for different height of our building and the different terrain category. So the height of our building up to the ridge level is 11 and our terrain category is 3. So I have marked this in a rectangular red rectangle because you can either interpolate between 10 and 15. Not you can but you must interpolate between this height 10 and 15 and then you will get a value between 0.91 and 0.97 but for now I have considered this same year 10 meter only so I have taken the terrain category as 0.91 the topography factor k3 is 1 for that look at clause 6.3.3 an importance factor for cyclonic reason our is not a cyclonic reason so k4 is equal to 1 these four factors we have got the values now we have to get the values of KD, KA and KC. These are another three factors that are necessary for the calculation of design wind pressure here. Because design wind pressure is KD into KA into KC into PZ. PZ value we will get from this 0.6 into VZ square. VZ value we will get from this VV into K1 into K2 into K3 into K4. So first KD, let's look here. Wind directionality factor we get from clause 7.2.1. 0 0.90 we got the value at 0 0.90 so i haven't posted that table here just go to the code and see this clause 7.2.1 area averaging factor i have taken as one to calculate the average area averaging factor you have to calculate the tributary area for purlins so what is the formula for tributary area span into spacing so the span of our Perlins is you have to let's see here let's go to my whiteboard and see our Perlins are in fact uh, these are these do not lie in an horizontal plane they lie in an inclined plane on top of these rafters here so our Perlins are directed in this way so you have to find the projected length of this Perlin on this horizontal plane and that will be the span of our Perlin and then you have to multiply that span by this spacing of our purlins. So the span of our purlin, let's look here. You see that the spacing of truss between different grids is different here. So I will take the maximum span here, which is 3.375. Find its projected length by multiplying this length by the cosine of the slope of our truss. That is cos 21.21 degrees. And after finding that projected span, I will multiply that with the spacing, which is 0 0.70. Then we will get the tributary area to be nearly equal to 2.20 meter square. So this tributary area is less than 10 square meter. You can see this table 4 for calculating area averaging factor. When the tributary area is less than or equal to 10, we take the factor to be 1. So area averaging factor is 1. And similarly, combination factor Kc is 0.90. For that, go to your code and look at this clause 7.3.3.13. Now, after calculating all of these factors, we will calculate first design wind speed, which is the product of this basic wind speed 50, and then these four factors k1, k2, k3, k4. We get the value to be 45.50 meter per second. Using this VZ, calculate the wind pressure at height Z, which is 0.6 into VZ square. You get to be 1242.15 Newton per meter square. And then multiply this PZ by these three factors, KD, KA, and KC, to get the design wind pressure, which comes out to be 1006.1. For that means nearly equal to 1 kN per meter square. And remember, when you take the product of this PZ and KD, KA, KC, if the value comes out to be less than 0.7 pz then you have to use this 0.7 pz value so this design wind pressure is subjected to a minimum value of 0.7 pz so this formula you can find in this clauses here 6.3 for design wind speed and 7.2 for design wind pressure now after calculating the value of this design wind pressure we have to calculate the internal and external coefficients pressure coefficients of our building so for internal pressure coefficient you go to your code and look at clause 7.3.2.2 what this clause says is that 
if the degree of permeability of your building is very small that means less than five percentage how do you find this five percentage permeability just calculate the percentage this area of all the openings in your building divided by area of all the walls into 100 so this gives us the percentage opening area of our structure so if this value is less than 5 percentage then our internal pressure coefficient will be plus minus 0 0.20 which is given in this same clause here but if this degree of opening lies between 5 percentage and 20 percentage that will be our medium openings and the internal pressure coefficient will be 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5 so we get this to be plus 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5 for our structure here and after that let's go to calculating external pressure coefficient and external pressure coefficient for our inclined roof depends upon the y by w ratio and the roof angle of the building y by w ratio means y is the height of our structure to eaves or paraffin which is 11 meter and w is the width of our building or the lesser horizontal dimension of our building 5.27 meter and finally slope of the roof is 21.21 degrees so take the value of our slope 21.21 and this value of s by w which is 2.09 and go then go to this table 6 here so table 6 gives us the external pressure coefficient for pitched roofs of rectangular clad buildings our s by w value is 2 point something so that means greater than 1.5 and less than 6 so this lies in this third group here and the angle of our roof truss is the angle of inclination is between 20 and 30 degree so we have this external pressure coefficient for wind angle 0 degree and wind angle 90 degree for these reasons here efgh that means ef here if you look at this diagram to the left hand side ef here and gh here when the wind is blowing normal to the ridge that means 0 degree and when the wind is blowing at 90 degree that means parallel to the ridge in this direction here then we have pressure coefficients ez and efh for areas ez and efh so these are the pressure coefficient that we need and you have to interpolate between these values because our slope angle is between this 20 and 30 you also have to interpolate the wind pressure coefficients for, for all of these eight values so let's look here for wind angle zero degrees we have for 20 degree windward and leeward pressure coefficient for 30 degree windward and leeward coefficients now use simple linear interpolation and find these values for 21.21 degrees similarly for 90 degrees wind angle also do the same interpolate between this first row and this third row and you will get the required values of external pressure coefficient now after finding all the required values that is the external pressure coefficient and this design wind pressure now we will calculate the actual wind force that will act on our structure and the value of the wind load on individual members is given in clause 7.3.1 of is 875 code which is cpe minus cpi that means the difference between external and internal pressure coefficient into area of that element surface area and into design wind pressure so if you use this formula you will get the value of f in kilonewton or newton but since we just want to calculate first here in kilonewton per meter square that means area load we will take this a to the left hand side and divide by a so that we will get this wind load in is area load so our formula now will be the difference of this pressure coefficient into pd only so let's see here we have two values of cpi one is a positive value and one is a negative value so for each cpe you have to find two values of this force one using positive internal pressure coefficient and another using negative internal pressure coefficient so let's first find the wind for wind force or wind load for wind angle zero degrees that means the wind is blowing normal or perpendicular to ridge. so the windward pressure will be first use this minus 0.8242 and minus 0 0.5 that means we have used here positive external coefficient sorry positive internal coefficient into pd 
you get this to be minus 1.33 kilonewton per meter square similarly next time use negative cpi so this minus negative cpi will come out to be positive now plus 0 0.5 and then you get this to be minus 0 0.33 Similarly, for leeward pressure, do the same. Use this external pressure coefficient, minus 0 0.5879, once with positive CPI and another with negative CPI. And then multiply the difference of these two pressure coefficients with the design wind pressure, and then divide it by 1000 to get the value in kilonewton per meter square, which you get to be minus 1.09 and minus 0.09. So this is for wind angle 0 degrees. Similar is the case for wind angle 90 degrees. Once with positive CPI and one with negative CPI. First here, minus 0 0.8, minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.8, plus 0 0.5. Similarly, minus 0 0.7879, minus 0 0.5, and minus 0 0.7879, plus 0 0.5, into PD, which is the design wind pressure. This is 1006.14 newton per meter square and divide by 1000 to get into kilonewton we get these four values for wind angle 90 degrees here now let's see here after calculating all these values you see that all of these forces are negative here that means negative means these are the uplift forces that is acting on our structure so generally what happens is that unless the roof slope is very high the wind load that are acting on our roof truss will usually be uplift force. That means this uplift force means the wind force will act from inside to the ex outer side. From the inside to the outer side. So these are our uplift forces. And another thing to take care is that if you remember when we applied dead load and live load we applied in the gravity direction that is vertical jet direction in this way they because they act vertically downwards but these uplift forces that is the wind forces do not act in this way they act perpendicular to the purlins here so if these wind forces are acting from outside to inside this will be perpendicular that means this will be 90 degree and again, if these are the uplift forces, then this will be perpendicular. So they do not act vertically downward like live load and dead load. So these are the things to take care. Now you can see that the maximum of these eight forces is minus 1.33 kilonewton per meter square. So we will use that as the uplift wind force that is acting on our structure. Now to convert this into uniformly distributed load as we talked in our last lecture similar to for dead load and live load multiply this uplift pressure by the spacing of purlin you get the unit per meter uplift force for intermediate purlins and if you divide it by two you will get the uplift force per unit meter for end purlins the concept is similar to for what we described for dead load and live load in our previous lecture so these are the loads that will be acting on our purlins here. So we will apply now these loads on our purlins. So let me go to my ETAPS model. Okay, let me just select these purlins. We created groups in our last lecture. So go to select, select, and then groups. We will select end purlins and intermediate purlins. And we will only make these selected objects visible by right clicking and then click on show selected objects only. So these are our purlins. Now to make sure that these wind forces are acting normal to these purlins, what we will do is we will shift or we will rotate the local axis of these purlins. So first go to this option here, set display option and then click on, go to this object assignment and under this frame assignment, click on local axis and click on OK at the bottom. So you can see here for each purlin, this red, blue and green axis are oriented in this way. And this is similar to our global XYZ axis. 
this RGB remember red axis is one axis green axis is two axis and blue axis is three axis so if we apply our wind loads in this green axis in the upward direction this will act vertically upward but we want our wind load to act normal to this purlin so what we will do is we will rotate this green axis of these purlin elements so for this purlin of our rays we do not have to do anything first select the purlins of our one half that is of this right hand half select all of these purlins okay what i will do is this will be easy i will make these grids invisible here so invert set grid system visibility now i will not change the local axis of these purlins above the ridge that means at the ridge level because for this ridge level purlin the vertical direction and the normal direction will be the same i will select these purlins first then i will go to assign frames and local axis so i will reverse or i will rotate this local axis by an angle equal to the degree of our slope so that will be positive 21.21 degrees you can see the difference here now this green axis are vertical if i change this to 21.21 and then apply now you can see here these vertical green axis became normal to these purlins here you can see here before it was vertically upward now these are normal to these purlins now do similar for our purlins on the other side that means the other side of our rays so select all of these purlins here now the angle will be minus 21.21 degrees and apply now you can see these have become normal to our purlins so let's click on ok now we will apply the wind load to apply the wind load first select all of these intermediate purlins in this way go to assign frame sorry frame loads and then distributed select the load pattern name is wind air and you have to apply the direction of load application in local two axis because this green which is now acting normally is local two axis and the value will be for this intermediate purlins 0.93 kN per meter so this should act away from the structure and you can see that our green axis is away from the structure so you can use positive value here so 0.9393 apply so now you can see this is the wind load acting on our truss go to assign clear display of assigns and now select the end purlins here the load pattern name will be wind direction of load application will be local to and the value of the load will be 0.47 click on apply and then click on close so this is the value of the wind load that is acting on our purlin members save the model so up to now we have completed the modeling and then application of load part so in our next class we will begin with the analysis of our structure so we will meet again in our next class until then bye bye